So if you want to use your information, that's fine, but it's going to be really hard for me to like help you through the math if there's 36 different people using 36 different volumes and things like that. Do you know what I mean? So if you want, you can just work through my information. So the sheet that I just gave you, right, the standardization analysis of sodium hydroxide, this is Walton's info. I did the titration, and this is what I got for results. I honestly, sincerely did this at the end of Tuesday's day. I made a standard solution. I made a primary standard, and then I titrated it. The same thing you did. And then at the end of yesterday's day, I, I, I took some vinegar and diluted it, and then I titrated that stuff as well. So um, everybody should have done the pre-lab calculation, and you should have all gotten 3.06 grams, right? Yeah, okay. I'm not going to run through that, because that's something that we've already done so far. But let's, let's talk about this. Here's my information. So when I did the titration, these are the volumes that I got. But I don't have, I didn't put in the final volumes. So let's, let's go ahead and calculate the final volumes, okay? If I get everybody in this row, everybody in the far rows, okay, do, just do number one. Everybody in this row, do trial number two. Everybody in this row, do trial number three. And you can do trial number three as well, okay? Just, we'll do it really quick. So 9.71 yes. for the far people, okay? And then also for trial number two, 9.71, right? Sorry, Caspi. And then for trial number three, 9.65, sure, whatever. Okay, but I already told you that yesterday. I told you that, that was my information. So what's the average volume for this? How do you do an average volume calculation? Add them all up and divide by the total number of trials. So if we had four trials, we would have to add them all up and divide by four. But we don't. We have three. So I'm going to go 9.71 milliliters plus 9.71 milliliters plus 9.65 bracket divided by three. Oh. Well, Maddie came in so she can grab a sheet from the purple pen. If that's okay with you, Maddie. Okay, I, sorry, I didn't mean to raise that as a question. Nine point six nine. Sure. That was the average volume. Nine point six nine million. Okay, well, let's do our solution stoichiometry to calculate the, uh, uh, the concentration of the sodium hydroxide. Remember, we use the primary standard to get the concentration of the titrant, and then on the last day we use the tight concentration of the titrant to get the concentration of our vinegar. That was the whole point. So, what two things, I'm curious, do you remember what two things we were reacting here? We were reacting our KHP and our sodium hydroxide. Now remember, KHP isn't made up of potassium, hydrogen, and phosphorus, right? It's just a shorthand, but whatever. What is the sodium hydroxide going to steal away from the KHP? The hydrogen. It's going to jack that hydrogen. <clears throat> so we're going to end up with potassium sodium phthalate, and we're going to end up with water. Whoa, liquid, perfect. Now, remember, these are the two things we have, right? We've got this thing and that thing. Can you just get off your phone, please? Thank you. <clears throat> We've got potassium hydrogen and phthalate. Do you know how much volume of uh, potassium, do you know what volume of potassium hydrogen and phthalate you used? 
No. If we went back through here and looked at the instructions, it says pipette a 10 milliliter sample of potassium hydrogen phthalate into a clean Erlen lab once. Right? So our volume was 10 milliliters. Do you remember what the concentration of potassium hydrogen phthalate is? 0.15. Yeah, that was the reason for us dissolving 3.06 grams, right? The whole point was we wanted to get a solution that was 0 0.150 moles. So 0 0.150 moles per liter. We got that from us dissolving 3.06 grams of this stuff. Okay, we have a volume and a concentration of this stuff. Are we good there? Yeah, yeah that's what we want. Now, we want the concentration of sodium hydroxide in order to do that, what else do we need? Do we know the volume of sodium hydroxide that was added? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do. You just calculated it, didn't you? Yeah. On average, it took 9.69 milliliters. So now, could you get moles of KHP turn moles of KHP into moles of sodium hydroxide and then get the concentration of sodium hydroxide? Yeah, the only other thing we need is a molar ratio, right? And what's the molar ratio? One to one. It's one to one. Yeah. So one mole of sodium hydroxide for every one mole of KHP. So you're looking for the concentration in moles per liter of sodium hydroxide. Well, this is just a solution stoichiometry problem, right? Give yourself a minute to try and start it out at least. At least start it out. You don't have to finish it right now, but start it out. I would start with the molar ratio. The reason why I would start with the molar ratio is because it's got moles of sodium hydroxide on top. Perfect, no problem. And then I'm going to try and cancel out moles of potassium hydrogen and phthalate. Sorry, I'm feeling really sick, so my voice is totally going to crack today. That's okay. Moles of sodium uh, or potassium hydrogen and phthalate. So we've got 0 0.15. For every one liter of KHP. So now we just got to get rid of liters of KHP. Do we want liters of KHP on the bottom? No. 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 We want liters of what? Uh, sodium hydroxide. Sodium hydroxide. So if we used 10 milliliters of KHP, and on average we use 9.69 milliliters of sodium hydroxide, Hopefully you get 0 0.155, 0 0.15, sure, let's just say 5, moles per liter of sodium hydroxide. Perfect. Awesome. Now that we got that, now that we have our concentration of sodium hydroxide, now we can do our analysis of vinegar. Okay. What? 
So when we look at this, ah, oh, man, did, is yours all messed up or is your table okay? No. It's okay? Just mine? Whatever, that's fine. So in, in the title here of the evidence table, we should have done this for the last table too, but this was, this was the titration of 10 milliliter samples of vinegar with 0 0.155 mole per liter sodium hydroxide. That's, that's the title I would use. You don't have to write that down, but you can if you want to. Titration of 10 milliliter samples of vinegar, diluted vinegar, is 0 0.155 mole per liter mm -hmm. sodium hydroxide. Now, we could do the exact same thing again, right? Because this is just going to be a different reaction. It's kind of the same, but it's a different reaction. So I would like us to do the same thing. You calculate type or trial number one. You calculate trial number two. You all calculate trial number three. Because I don't remember what they were. Ten point six one, ten point six eight, and ten point six six. So again, let's calculate the average volume, V average. So we'll add up all of our volumes: ten point six one plus ten point six eight milliliters plus ten point six six milliliters, and divide by three. 10.65? Yes. I'm curious, how many people got close to 10.6-ish yesterday for their average volumes? 10.59? 10 10.60? 10 That's pretty damn good. That's really good. That was your last two. The first, the, the first day, I think our first day of titrations, I think our first day of titrations was a little rough. I don't know about you, but it was a little rough, okay? But the second day of titrations, did the second day go a little bit smoother than the first day? Yeah, yeah big time, right? Yeah. That's because you had already screwed up once and you learned from your mistakes and you, 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 just, you were human beings, you just learned from your mistakes and that's what you should be doing and that's totally fine. Okay, and this is why I don't like doing a lab report for this one, is because that first day of titrations is rough. It's always rough. People all over the place. People are rinsing their burette with acid. People are pipetting up sodium hydroxide. People are mixing things when they're not supposed to. People forget to add phenolphthalein. Holy guacamole, it's just a nightmare. But that's totally fine. Okay, now let's do our solution stoichiometry. Let's think about this. Do we have, do we have a volume for our vinegar? Yes, and do we have a, we want concentration of vinegar. In order to get concentration of vinegar, we need the concentration of sodium hydroxide and the volume of sodium hydroxide. We have all of those things, right? This is the exact same reaction that's in your notes. Um, we need a reaction first, so it's sodium hydroxide. What is the thing in vinegar that makes it vinegar? Standing out. Acetic acid, CH3COOH, which is going to be a big pain in the butt. I hate that. You have to write out CH3COOH four times. What's it going to make? Do you remember? H2O. 
The hydroxide is going to rip what off of the acid? The hydrogen. And it's going to make water. And what are you left with? Sodium acetate, right? NaCH3COH. Um, I don't know about you, but I'm probably going to run out of room. That's because I'm not good at writing things on this on this board. So we know how much sodium hydroxide did we use on average? 10.65 mils. And we had a concentration of 0 0.155 moles per liter. And then our our acetic acid, we know we had 10 milliliters of this stuff, and we're trying to find the concentration. So could you, I'm curious, could you find the concentration in moles per liter of acetic acid? Yes, you could. Go ahead. Do that. So I'm not going to show you the work. This is the exact same thing as uh, the last example in our titration notes package. But somebody tell me what was the concentration, Wim? 0 0.165 moles per liter of uh, CH3COOH. Okay. And then because, do you remember taking the vinegar out of the bottle yesterday and diluting it? <coughs> You took 10, vol 10, 10 milliliters, but you did that twice. So that's, that's a five times dilution. What that means is we measured a concentration five times less than it is in reality. So take this number and multiply it by five. I, so, so what I measured when I did my lab, I got... 0 0.825 moles per liter of acetic acid. And what's, what's the actual concentration of acetic acid in real life? What's it supposed to be? Call that the concentration is 0 0.83, right? Did I get kind of close to the actual value? Yeah. I got pretty darn close. I'm not trying to toot my own horn, but that's okay, right? And if you would have done, if you would have done the first titration with the same degree of care and quality that you did the second day of titrations, you probably would have gone pretty darn close to that as well. 
probably 0 0.81 or 0 0.80 or something like that. But yeah, I, I was walking around yesterday and I was seeing a lot of really high quality titrations. And I'm really happy with the amount of work that people put in yesterday. So I just want to say thank you. Does this math, does this work kind of make sense? Yes? Okay. I'm going to ask you to basically reproduce this, but with different information tomorrow. I'm going to put the video up online, or I'm going to try to as soon as the day ends today. So if you're, if you're going back through your notes and you're like, I have no idea what Walton was doing, then you can just watch this video and that'll be totally fine. Is that okay? So I'm going to try and put this up on YouTube uh, as quick as I can. But that's enough for this lab. You can see the expectations at the end of this document, right? The, like a checklist of all the stuff you need to know how to do. We are going to move on to the very last topic of our chemical analysis unit. the very last concept that we want to talk about in our, our uh, chapter 7 and 8 combined unit, which is called chemical analysis. Um, believe me when I say there is very little math involved in this. Okay, so some of you will be happy about this. But it's a little bit more conceptual. I don't know if you're happy or sad about that. We'll see how it goes. It'll be fun. We're going to talk about a pH curve. And what a pH curve is, it's this. A pH curve is a pH curve is we're going to graph the pH of a solution as we either add a strong base or a strong acid to it. So let's take a look at this, okay? I want to know at the very beginning of the graph, before I've added any titrant, were we dealing with an acid or a base? Acid. How do you know we were dealing with an acid? It's pH of 2, which is less than 7, right? So we've got an acid in our analyte, or in our um, Erlenmeyer flask. So as I'm, as I'm titrating this thing, if I continuously measure the pH of this solution using something called a pH probe, then what we can do is we can graph the quantity of titrant added and the resulting pH. Now, what I want to bring your attention to is, do you remember that hypothetical point that we could never actually stop our titration at? Yeah, that was, that's that equivalence point, right? When you add equal numbers of molecules for your two reactants. Remember, we're dealing with such large numbers that that, that point doesn't ever actually exist. But we can see where it would exist on a pH curve. We can identify where that point would exist when we graph the pH and the volume of titrant added. So when we look at this, I'm just going to go back to the top. You have, you have it on the same page. A pH, or an acid-base titration curve, is a graph of the pH of the solution on the vertical axis versus how much titrant you've added. As we do a titration, we can measure the pH, and every half milliliter or so, we can graph the relationship. The volume of the titrant is plotted on the x-axis, and the pH of the solution is plotted on the y-axis. There are four scenarios. This is the first scenario we need to kind of uh, uh, be aware of, okay? So let's, let's just um, write it all down. So the first one is a titration of a strong acid with strong base. The 
second one is a titration of, well, what are the other options? Instead of titrating a strong acid, what could I titrate? I could try titrate a weak acid with a strong base. Instead of titrating an acid, what could I titrate? I could titrate a base. So I could titrate a strong base with, if I wanted to react a strong base with something, what would I react it with? Probably a strong acid, yeah. I'll give you a hint, your titrant, the thing in your uh, burette, should always be either a strong acid or a strong base. You want it to react really, really well. And what's the last thing? A weak base with a strong acid, yeah. Titration of a weak base with strong acid. I put quotation marks because I'm sick and tired of writing quotation marks. You have to be able to analyze these. You have to be able to see them and know is this a strong acid or a strong base? Is it a weak acid or is it a weak base? And I want to show you a titration in real time. Is that okay? I would like to show you a titration in real life, in real time. So what's going to happen? In my burette here, in my burette here, I've got a, uh, I've got a strong acid. I've got hydrochloric acid. And what do you want to titrate? Do you want to titrate a strong base first or a weak base first? Strong, strong base first. All right, let's do that. So we're going to titrate a strong base first. Now, this is a little bit of a nightmare. I'm going to make sure nothing gets pulled off of here. I'm getting dragged in a couple different directions here. i got to unplug this thing, and i got to plug it into this thing. Yeah, there we go. Okay, this is, uh, this is the last titration curve that was put up there. Don't, don't worry about it, okay? So we're going to titrate a strong base. Um, what's a strong base you would like to titrate? One of them. <laughs> one of them. One of, one of them. One of the strong bases. What is a strong base? Nope. I know, those are strong acids, right? Right? Sodium hydroxide or anything hydroxide, right? We're going to use sodium hydroxide, okay? So what's going to happen is I'm going to pipe that out uh, 10 milliliters of sodium hydroxide. I'm going to pipe that out 10 milliliters of sodium hydroxide. Lamo. And uh, I'm going to add an indicator. The indicator is going to be bromothymol blue. And so as I add the bromothymol blue, ooh, that's probably too much, but that's fine. Okay. So I've added my bromothymol blue. And I'm going to set this on a magnetic stirrer. I don't know how many people can see this. But the magnetic stir basically does the swirling for me. Yeah, so instead of instead of having you know, you do you remember yesterday? Of course you do, right? I forced you to use your dominant yeah. hand, and then I forced you to use your non-dominant hand to do this. Well there was a there was a quote unquote easier way of doing that. It's with a magnetic stir, but I wanted you to put in the work and actually do it yourself. Thank you. By the way. Using your non, using your dominant hand to swirl and using your non-dominant hand to, to do the uh, the titration is actually the better way. It's the more accurate way. Okay. Uh, uh, because I I need to run this program at the same time. Come on, why would you ask me that? That's a great question to ask, by the way. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stick my pH probe into here. 
And I'm going to turn this on. And what I want to know is what is the pH that I'm reading right now? <laughs> That's okay. It's okay. You're all, everybody's looking up here and you're like, yeah, 12.5 something, whatever. Yeah, 12.8 something, okay? Now, what's going to happen is I'm going to add this at a consistent rate. And what's going to happen when I add the acid to this? The pH is going to go down. And we're going to see how does it go down. We're going to see what shape it forms when it goes down, okay? So I'm going to do this. I'm going to put that out of the way, actually. There we go. Perfect. Okay, so I'll add it at a consistent rate. Uh-oh. 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 I think it's not reading properly because there's not enough volume in there. There we go. Woo! Whoops, sorry. The pH probe, just the liquid, the water level just wasn't, it wasn't high enough for the pH probe to read it. So all you got to do is imagine that this, this went, it kept going, it just kept going. Okay? <laughs> Don't worry about the blips. Ooh. Ah. It's done, isn't it? <laughs> what was the color when I put it in there? Blue. It was blue. Yeah. And what, what's the color right now, if you yeah, can see red. it? It's, <laughs> it's not red, it's yellow. Okay. Okay, perfect. So what happened, just imagine that this went straight from there to there. Okay, it's a very, very continuous line with no little blips or valleys or peaks or whatever. So what happened was the, the pH started to change slowly and then it changed rapidly. And then what happened, once I got to here, once I got past the equivalence point, then the pH started to stay pretty much the same. Why? What happens at the equivalence point? I've run out of base to react with, right? So if there's no more base to react with, and I'm just adding acid, do you think at some point in time the acid, the pH, will just level off? Because I can't, it doesn't matter how much, if I continue to add more acid, the pH can't get any lower, right? It can't get any lower than the pH of my titrate. So that's, okay, that was a strong base with a strong acid. And so I'm just going to take this and I'm going to, don't do this. Getting the magnet stir out is a little bit of a pain in the butt to clean off my pH probe, and we're going to take a look at a strong, or sorry, a weak base instead. So I could do a weak base, and the weak base that I'm going to titrate is ammonia. But the first thing I got to do is I got to pipe that out to 10 milliliters of ammonia. so that we don't get the exact same malfunction we had earlier. Remember, is it okay to add water? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Am I changing the number of molecules? No. no, I'm not, right? I'm diluting them, yes, but I'm not changing the number of molecules. Let's make sure that we do not run into that problem. Okay, so I'm going to put this on there. And I'm going to put my pH probe in here, and we're going to measure. Look, what was the pH that I started at um, in this with the strong base this time? It's 12.86, something like that, right? And so let's see. I'm going to start measuring the pH. And we're starting out at a little bit lower of a pH, and that's fine. That's not always the case for a weak base. It depends on the concentration, but whatever, that's fine. So I'm going to add my bromothymol blue, and it's blue for sure. 
Now I have to add more hydrochloric acid just to top it up. Perfect. Okay, so let's go ahead and let it rip. So what's the first thing you see? It, it dropped pretty dramatically, but it's kind of leveling off again. That's not the same thing we saw last time. It, like, it dropped dramatically, and then it's leveling off. That's not what we saw the last time. Whoop. Do we still see the same sharp decline in pH? Yes. Yeah. And then it's the same thing, right? After the equivalence point, we've run out of base to react with. Would you agree? Yes. So now it's just we're adding more and more and more and more and more and more and more acid, right? And yes, absolutely, my pH, whoop, my pH um, just can't get any lower than this. So there's some things that I want to bring your attention to, and I should have done this before. I want you to take a look at the middle, the absolute middle of the drop here. Like this big sharp decline. If we were to look at the absolute middle of this big sharp decline, it's somewhere around here. Would you agree that's where it is? Yeah. yeah. So if I go over, where is the pH? What pH is that middle point of the decline? It's, it's right here. So it's it's a little bit below seven. So that point is slightly acidic, okay? Let's think about this. I'm titrating, I'm titrating uh, ammonia, which is NH3. And what am I titrating it with? What's the strong acid I put in the view? Hydrochloric acid, right? When I'm done, when everything is said and done, when this thing reacts with that thing, this is a base, right? What do bases do? Do they steal hydrogens or give away hydrogens? Steal. They steal hydrogens. So this is going to steal the hydrogen. What's it going to turn into? It's going to turn into ammonium. And then what am I going to be left with? just a chloride ion, right? A chloride ion. I'm curious. <clears throat> Once, if I, if I add exactly the same amount to both of these things, right? If, all, if I added 10 of these molecules and 10 of these molecules, these 10 would react with those 10, and I'd have none of these left. Do you agree with that? Yes. Yeah. What would I have in my beaker if all 10 of these reacted with all 10 of these? What would I end up with? Just ammonium and chloride. Chloride is one of those group 17 things, right? We don't really care about group 17 ions. But ammonium, can you look that up in your data booklet under the table of acids and bases? I want you to tell me, is that an acid or is that a base? Is it an acid or a base? Acid. It's an acid, right? So my, my final solution, my final solution at the very, like not at the end of the titration, but at the end of this reaction, if these are the only two things that are in my beaker, is this solution going to be acidic or basic? Acidic. 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 Do you see why that halfway point was below a pH of 7? Because the only stuff I had left in my beaker, once both of these all reacted, the only stuff I had left with was an acid and a neutral compound. So when the reaction was over, it was acidic. Okay, so I just, I just want to bring your attention to that. So let's take a look at this. This is a titration curve. This is basically exactly what we just did, but the opposite way. What are we starting with in our, in our sample at the beginning of this experiment? Strong acid. We're starting with a, uh, an acid, right? And we don't know if it's a strong acid or a weak acid, but you know, whatever. 
Um, it is a strong acid. It's hydrochloric acid. So as I slowly add sodium hydroxide, what's going to happen to the pH? It's going to go up, but it goes up in a very specific way. It kind of slowly rises, and then it jumps up, and then it levels off again. Now, I want to be very clear that the equivalence point, that's when we've added equal amounts of acid and base. Our equivalence point is always when we've added, and that's the, the hypothetical point when we've added equal amounts of this and this. So they both completely react, we've got none of this left over, and we only have our products, right? So that's the idea behind it. Now, what we want to do, when we're picking an indicator for our reactions, we always want to pick an indicator that falls in the middle of this sharp incline or that sharp decline that we saw earlier. So thymol blue, this is the pH range of thymol blue. Is that appropriate? Is, that, is this matching up with the midpoint of, or the equivalence point here? No. No. Wim. Is that why you're doing the filtration, that you don't want to go off change itself and benefit? That's exactly right. It's because what happens when you add, when you add, this is, this is all happening at 20 milliliters, right? So what happens when you add 20.1 milliliters? That's the difference between here and here. What kind of a pH jump is that? That's maybe one or two pH units with just one drop of acid or base. That's why it was so important that you get like a half drop or just as close to you could possibly know, right? Okay, perfect. Um, so you can, you can tell a lot about this graph, right? How much, how, much base, how much base was required to neutralize this substance? Yeah, 20 milliliters, right? At pH of 7, it was 20 milliliters. Um, <clears throat> so there's, there's lots of things. Bromothymol blue is an appropriate indicator to use. If we choose uh, an indicator like alizarin yellow, the indicator pH is way too high, we're going to miss the equivalence point, right? So our end point isn't going to match up with our equivalence point. Remember, the end point is the color change you see. The equivalence point is the point in the reaction that you're trying to match up with the end point, right? So if your end point doesn't match your equivalence point, then you're going to have the wrong values in your titration. <clears throat> let's, let's, yeah, you got to go, you got to go. Let's take a look and let's kind of uh, uh, draw the titration curve for a strong base titrated with a strong acid. That's exactly what we saw on our first, uh, on our, uh, our first titration. So we've got pH over on the side, and at the, on the bottom should be volume <laughs> of titrant added. <coughs> In milliliters. <clears throat> what are we starting with? What's in our sample? It says a sample of 0 0.10 mole per liter sodium hydroxide. Now remember, how do we get a pOH from a concentration of sodium hydroxide? No. If you had the pH, you could do that, right? But, okay, this concentration of sodium hydroxide, that's the same as the concentration of hydroxide. Do you agree? When we put sodium hydroxide in water, it splits up. So this is actually the concentration of hydroxide. Do you remember trying to figure out, well, the pOH is the negative log of the hydroxide concentration. Do you remember that? How long ago was that? How long ago was that? That was three weeks ago. I mean, it might as well have been 10 years, right? As far as some of us are concerned. 
And the, this is the reason why I'm doing this, okay? Now, if you put negative log 0 0.1 moles per liter, if you do that, you're going to get a pOH of 1, 0 0.00. If my pOH is 1, what's my pH? 13, good. So we got a pH of 13. I'm just, I'm just trying, that it's not required for this problem, not really. I just wanted to kind of flash back to those equations. Because how many people put a lot of work into memorizing those, those equations? Yeah, a couple of us, okay. You don't want to forget them, because you still need them. You're going to need them next year, too, or next semester, if you take Chem 30. Okay, so what's the pH? What's the pH of my sample, then? What's the pH of my sample? It's pH of 13. So we're going to start up here. And what's going to happen is because I'm adding a strong acid, what's going to happen to our, our pH? Is it going to slowly increase or slowly decrease? It's going to slowly decrease. So what's going to happen is it's going to slowly decrease, and then all of a sudden it's going to take a sharp drop, and then it's going to level off. That's because you're saying minus log and not negative log, probably. Okay, we'll talk later. I'd have to look at your specific model of calculator to be able to figure out what's going on. Okay. <clears throat> when I draw my graph, when I draw my graph, the middle of the sharp decline should be right at 7. It should be right at 7. Now, the reason why I know this sharp decline is going to be at 7 is because let's try and figure out, let's try and figure out what things we get when we react hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide together. I'm going to move on to the next slide. Write the net ionic equation for the reaction of sodium hydroxide and hydrochloric acid. Man, this is also a blast from the past. Holy guacamole. Ah, uh, what do you mean, ah? Uh, it'll be okay. What two things are we reacting together? Sodium hydroxide. Sodium hydroxide. And hydrochloric acid, right? Okay, what do we? What is this going to produce? When you get sodium hydroxide and hydrochloric acid, this is a double per replacement reaction. So what are we going to get? So, uh, HOH. Good. So HOH and sodium chloride, right? Oh, not aqueous liquid. Do you remember, again, this is, this is like part review. This is tiny little bit review, but actually we're focusing on what's going on here. <clears throat> when we write a net ionic equation, we can ignore certain things. Do you remember that? Yes. Yeah. Only in ionic compounds, we can ignore group 1, 2, and 17 things. Where do I see ionic compounds in here? NaOH, right? Yeah. So is this going to split up? Like, when, if it can, remember step two when you're doing net ionic equations is split it up if it can split up, right? So sodium hydroxide, is that going to split up? Yes, it's totally going to split up, right? You're going to get sodium ions and hydroxide ions. Hydrochloric acid, when I add hydrochloric acid, is it going to split up? Yes, it's going to split up. So I'm going to get hydrogen ions and chloride ions. Water, is water going to split up? No. Sodium chloride, is sodium chloride going to split up? Yes. Why yes or why no? It's ionic and it's high solubility, right? So what are, 
what are some things that we know are going to cancel out here? Sodium. Sodium cancels out with sodium. Chloride cancels out with chloride. And what are we getting? OH and H plus. They give us what? Water. I'm curious. If I add 10 hydroxides and 10 hydrogen ions together, what is that going to give me? It's going to give me 10 water molecules. And what's the pH of water? Seven. When this reaction is all said and done, look at the products of this reaction. Are they neutral, acidic, or basic? Neutral. They're neutral. Does that explain why the equivalence point landed directly on seven? Mm -hmm. When this reaction is done, we only have neutral things in our solution. Does that make sense? When this reaction was done, did we only have neutral things in our solution? No, we had an acid left over. That's why the equivalence point was acidic. Does that make sense? So you can predict, if I give you a reaction, you could predict whether or not the equivalence point would be higher or lower than seven. Let's take a look at a strong acid titrated with a strong base. And we're not gonna, we're, we're just gonna take a look at it. Okay, remember, what, what are we adding together? What two things? HCl and sodium hydroxide. Is this basically the exact same reaction as here? What are we adding together? HCl and sodium hydroxide. Except this time, we're starting with an acid, right? So we're starting with an acid. We're starting down here. And what's going to happen to the pH? As you slowly add a base, what's going to happen to the pH? Of the it's going to increase. It's going to increase, and then at some point it's going to take a sharp increase, and then it's going to level off. Tell me, where is the equivalence point going to be? Seven. It's the same thing, right? It's going to be at seven. We're not going to write the net ionic equation again because it's the exact same thing as the last one. Okay. Now let's let's take a look at uh, a different titration. Okay, so uh, okay, a strong acid. Let me just let's just say this. Anytime you have a strong acid plus a strong base, the equivalence point. will always what? Neutral. Be at a pH of 7. Always. A strong acid plus a strong base gives you water. Water plus a neutral ionic compound. But let's take a look at something that's not the case. Let's take a look at a weak acid reacting with a strong base. So here's a weak acid reacting with a strong base. This is exactly what you did in your lab. This is the exact same thing as you did in your lab, right? So we're titrating acetic acid with sodium hydroxide. That's what we did in our lab, okay, no problem. <clears throat> What I want to, to kind of bring to your attention, this isn't the greatest graph, but it, it kind of looks like, we're, remember that we, this is when we started adding our base. Whoa, three Ds, holy. This is when we started adding our base. 
and our pH jumped up pretty dramatically. That's a really good indication that you have, your sample is a weak acid or weak base because it jumps up. It's got like this little, this little hump to it and then it kind of levels off for a little bit and then you get the spike. So let's take a look at this. Where is the middle of that large increase? If you went here to here, Nine. The middle, right in between them, is nine. Nine. Why is it nine? Because it's a weak acid. It's a weak acid. And what what must be? What are we probably making at the equivalence point? What do we? If we if we're starting with a weak acid, we're going to turn it into a weak base. And let's prove that to ourselves. Is that okay? This is an equivalence point of pH 9. Let's prove to ourselves why it's a pH of 9. Okay? Let's write a net ionic equation for the reaction of acetic acid and sodium hydroxide. This is going to be really easy. Don't worry about it. Sodium hydroxide. is reacting with acetic acid. What's it going to turn into? I'll give you a hint. We've already written this down once. Water and the sodium acetate together, right? Okay, now what I want to ask you is, is sodium acetate soluble? It's sodium, right? It has, so it has to be soluble. So aqueous. Is there anything in here we can break apart? Is there anything in here that does break apart when we add it to water? The sodium hydroxide, yeah, it's a, it's a strong base. It's an ionic hydroxide. So yeah, it will. So we got sodium ions. Hydroxide ions. What about acetic acid? What kind of an acid is acetic acid? I don't know. It's aqueous, but all acids are aqueous. Every acid is aqueous, right? Is it a strong acid or a weak acid? And if you're not looking it up, then then poo poo on you. Yeah. <laughs> Is it a strong or a weak acid? Weak. It's weak acid. So what does that mean? Does it split up mostly or does it mostly not split up? Not, not split up. Okay, well, we've got to keep it together then. Water. Does water split up? No. No. It's a molecular compound, right? It doesn't split up. Sodium acetate. Does it split up? Yes. Yeah, it's an ionic. That's high solubility, CH3CO minus. Something to remember is our two laws, right? When's the last time I said something about our two laws? A long time ago. It was probably a month ago. Charge and mass, right? Concentration of mass and concentration of charge. Does this add up? with our law of conservation of mass and charge. Yeah, don't focus on the mass right now, but focus on the charge. A positive and a negative on that side, a positive and a negative on that side. We're good, all right, fine. Is there anything we can cancel out on here? Oh, baby, absolutely. Black, black. There you go. So what are we gonna get? What's our final uh, net ionic equation? Hydroxide steals a proton away from acetic acid. And what are we going to be left with? Water and CH3COO minus. I'm curious, does this, does this equation explain why our pH at equivalence was basic? How? How does it explain it? I don't get it. <laughs> what do we get? At equivalence, at the equivalence point, 
all of this has reacted with all of this, so none of this remains, right? It's all gone. What's the only stuff in our beaker left? Water and and acetate. Is either one of these things either acidic or basic? Ba is this thing basic? I don't know, you tell me. How do you know if something's basic? You look under the table of acids and bases under the base column. Is this, is acetic, or a sodium acetate, sorry? Okay, where is it? What the hell is going on here? Right there, right there. CH3, ah, it's right there, right? Is that acidic or basic? That's basic! Can you explain to me, would you be able to explain why the equivalence point is basic? for this titration. Would you be able to do that now? Because at, at equivalence, equivalence means we've run out of both of these things, right? Yes. So we only have this. So what would be the pH of a mixture of a neutral thing and a basic thing? Basic. Is that okay? Yes. yes. So how can you tell how can you tell the difference between, how do I know that this, we started with a weak acid here? If I just gave you this graph, how would you know that we started with a weak acid and not a strong acid? Yeah, yeah there's a little hump, right? Yeah, there's a tiny little hump. Okay, let's say it didn't show you the hump. What's the equivalence point here? It's, n it's not at seven, right? Yeah. So that means we started with a weak acid. If we would have started with the strong acid, where would we have finished at? Seven. Seven. Does that make sense? Okay, perfect. Um, and it's the exact same stuff for bases. It's the exact same thing for bases, right? When I take a look at this, do you see? What are we starting with? Are we starting with a, an acid or a base? Yes. Starting with a base. And is it a weak acid or a weak base? Look at this little hump here. It's a weak base. And where's the equivalence point here? Six, six, six blah, blah. And halfway in between is right here. So it's about six, right? Which is the exact same thing we saw in our titration. This is the exact same titration that we just saw. So is this, is this a weak base or a strong base that we're starting out with? It's a weak base because we're not finishing at seven, right? The equivalence point isn't at seven. Does that kind of make sense? Kind of. Okay. Now, now I want you to totally switch gears, totally toss it in reverse. What would be an appropriate indicator? What indicator would you want to choose for this equivalence point? Remember, you want it to be bromothymol blue? You would like it to be bromothymol blue? Or what? What else? What's the equivalence point? Here, what's the equivalence point? Six-ish, right? So, one, two, three. Let's take a look at our indicators. Which indicators change color? And it has six kind of in the middle of the change in color. Okay, um, no, 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 no. Chlorophenol red's pretty good. Is a pH of six somewhere in the middle of this range? Yes. Yeah, it's literally smack dab in the middle of this range. Would bromothymol blue be appropriate? Yes. Is it somewhere in the middle of this range? No. No, no. so no. Bromothymol blue would not be appropriate to do. Okay? What about phenol red? No. no, six is way before there, right? The only appropriate indicator is chlorophenol red. So we would use chlorophenol red as our indicator. Does that kind of make sense? Yes. yes. It's all about equivalence point. Now, as a recap, 
We're not done yet, and that's totally fine. We're going to finish up tomorrow. That's okay. We got some more definitions to do. Um, what we're going to do tomorrow, we're going to do our quiz. And our quiz, I'm going to give you like 20 minutes on, 25 minutes on. And then we're going to finish this notes package, and then I'll give you time to work on our major assignment. But as a review of what we did today, could you define for me what the equivalence point is? Yes. No. <laughs> Not when you start. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It's when we we've added equal acid and base, and they're no longer present because they both reacted with each other. Right? There's no more acid. There's no more base. There's just only the products of our reaction and water. Yeah, I'm going to give you new numbers, but you have to do everything. All of that now. All of that. There's a checklist right here. What you, what you have to do.